I would like to introduce Tal Globus, who will be giving us a wonderful workshop on building tools for a DIY bio lab. So Tal, go ahead, take it away. Sure, so let's get the screen sharing started and then we'll have some fun. Alrighty, everyone hear me okay? Perfect, also, do you see this thing? Is that right now showing up? Do you see the, perfect, all right, so we're all set. So. Uh, hey guys, I am Tal and we're going to be talking about uh, building tools for a DIY bio lab. So um, first a little bit on me. Um, so I recently left uh, big tech, which is uh, something I'm really happy about. Uh, hopefully that can stick. I uh, started a uh, startup with a few friends of mine in biotech and we'll see where that goes. Um, I got my background in bio as part of Real Vegan Cheese, which is a really interesting project that you can take a look at if you're interested. Uh, hobbies, I like hiking, swimming, and uh, wait, that wasn't supposed to be in there. We don't talk about that anymore. Um, and then finally, uh, you can find me at uh, BioCurious, a uh, good amount of the time, and occasionally I'll pop in on Counterculture Labs as well. So uh, Bay Area in California. All right, so. Um, I like community, I like biotech. I love the fact that we can get a whole bunch of people to build some really, really cool stuff and you know, solve amazing problems and have a lot of fun doing it and you know, create this, this amazing culture of people who are, who are sharing progress and helping each other. And so my goal for this talk and kind of as part of you know, biotech in general beyond solving specific problems is I wanna turn uh, you know, our, our existing community into a bigger one. And by the way, dead serious, you don't have no idea how long it takes to do this kind of photo editing. Um, so I uh, would like to talk about a big problem that I see in the process of opening up this field to more people and about how we can solve it and hopefully make better tools uh, that we can all use at the same time. Uh, so uh, what is this problem? Well, there are a number of them. And if you're interested, I'm going to be uh, giving another talk uh, tomorrow afternoon about um, a few other issues here. But the big problem that I'm looking to solve today um, is uh, tools. So uh, what do I mean by tools? Like, you know, what, what is that? What's, what's the problem? Well, so I went looking for an example of, uh, you know, just some random piece of labware that we can all buy. This is a screenshot from an actual shopping cart online. Uh, it's a PCR machine. And uh, this is uh, it's kind of a lot of money. It's a big issue, right? Um, and when it really comes down to it, this is kind of something that we see a lot in, in biotech. Um, so uh, what, like, you know, wh where does this come from? What's, what's the issue and how do we fix it? Well, in science, uh, we really depend on being able to make really, really precise and repeatable changes to highly controlled systems. And in order to do that, you need very well engineered, uh, sorry about that, um, just a second, always, always with the weird technical issues, apologies about that. All right, so you need to be able to make really, really precise changes to really, really um, uh, precise uh, systems, essentially well-controlled systems. Um, and so the problem that you have here is that there aren't that, it's a very hard thing to do to, to tweak something so, so well-controlled. And the companies that tend to be in the market for these sorts of products tend to be very, you know, quite well endowed. And so um, what this means from an economic standpoint is that uh, it's, they're expensive things to build and because there isn't very much pricing pressure, it's, they're very, very expensive to buy. And so the issue kind of comes down to cost. And this is something that has significantly contributed to lessening the availability of this field to more people. You know, this is one of the biggest constraints, if not the biggest constraint of more people having access to this field. Um, essentially that in uh, today's environment, if you, you know, don't have money, you really can't do science and especially you can't do biotech. And this is the problem that we set out to solve. Um, so uh, as it happens, you know, rather fortunately, we are you know, a bunch of uh, DIY bio citizen scientists and uh, in some cases, actual engineers. Uh, so here we have this horrible situation and um, let's, let's start working the problem, right? So, so let's see if we can fix this. So we need a way of overcoming financial limitations if we wanna grow our community, nice and simple. Let's work the problem. Hold on, that was, that was a gorgeous meme that was supposed to pop up. Let's work the problem. There we go. All right, so 
Um, what does a lab actually need? So a lab needs, uh, you know, centrifuges, other sorts of uh, separation equipment, so they kind of lumped it under the category of, of separation. Um, those tend to be enormously expensive. Microscopes are reasonably expensive. Uh, vortex shakers, spur plates, a uh, little expensive, also not entirely necessary, but um, okay, thermocyclers, uh, basically devices for temperature control in general, um, very expensive. Uh, incubators, reasonably expensive. Refrigerators and freezers, reasonably expensive. Uh, data collection, now this is kind of a, a broad category, essentially lumping, uh, lumping uh, sensors as well as you know, data collection equipment, um, a number of different you know, sorts of assays you can do kind of all falls under that category and so the, the price varies significantly. Um, now, used, uh, notably, there, there are two things that we kind of uh, are, are not thinking about here because we take them for granted. One of them is consumables. Consumables are enormously expensive and really problematic, and there's no real good solution to this problem that doesn't directly target consumables. And the other is uh, clean water. Now, when I say clean water, I don't mean drinking water. I mean like millipore water. Essentially, especially if you're going to do you know some sort of PCR reaction or a lot of you know a lot of these uh, enzymatic assays. Um, you need access to like very high quality water and something that is, is very easy to, to forget about because it's, it's something that's kind of hard to, to set up an area with. Also, uh, before we dig too deep into this is um, there are a few things that we're going to not discuss here just because they unfortunately do fall well out of the scope of things we can, we can tackle ourselves. One is problems involving infrastructure. Um, so if you don't have access to reliable electricity, water or internet, there's not that much we can do here through this talk. Um, and then also, uh, I'd say, uh, so we're based in the US, you guys can be based you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, we're rather fortunate that um, a lot of this stuff is, is very easy to do from, from a legality standpoint, depending on where in the world you are, um, this can be considered any, you know, working in, in biotech uh, without, you know, the proper licenses can be considered anything from, uh, you know, trafficking dangerous materials to engaging in bioterrorism. So it's, it's a serious problem, but also nothing that we have the capacity to fix within this talk. So we're going to be working on these issues over here. All right. Now, if we start looking at uh, kind of what we're dealing with here, we have a few basic functions that we have to fill. We have to heat things, we have to cool things, we have to mix things, and we have to separate things. And then there's kind of this other category, which we're largely going to ignore. And as soon as you, you reduce it to these four categories, you realize that there are some serious optimizations that we can use to cut costs. Um, and so the, kind of the goal here is going to say, how, how far can we push this? by moreover going over specific implementations of, of kind of these four types of, of you know, tackling these four categories specifically so that we can find a way of you know cutting all of you know what this stuff away right uh, basically avoiding this this here number so um, if we can find a precise and inexpensive way to heat, cool, mix, and separate samples, then we can pull the money out of science. And so that's, that's kind of the goal. And if we can do that, then we can open up our community, increase the, the number of people involved, the, the number of demographics that can get involved, the, the amount of innovation that we can see. And so, you know, everyone wins, right? So, um, heating. It turns out this is a very easy problem to solve, and you don't really need a $99,000 piece of equipment to do it. On, on the right, you can see uh, this is a standard range top. Uh, you, you find these as part of like any stove ever. Um, and the system that they use is something that's actually really easy to replicate with a little bit of electronics knowledge. And so you can, you can do this without needing you know, anything you know, nearly that expensive. Essentially, you need four parts. You need a heating element, something that can, that can uh, provide, you know, usually a, a resistive heater is probably the, the best option. That's what's shown here, but there are a number of options. Um, you, you need a sensor, uh, something that you can use to essentially to, to read back in for feedback on the current temperature. That's shown on the left is a thermocouple, this, this wire over here, and then you can also find it in another of other, a number of other uh, form factors. These tend to be very inexpensive. Uh, three, you need some kind of brains, which unfortunately does tend to also require a, a, a little bit of electronics experience. Uh, this here is an Arduino. It's a, a very uh, widely used part for prototyping. Um, you can get a, an inexpensive one for, I believe, six ninety nine in uh, US off of uh, their website or Amazon. I don't remember which. And then finally, uh, like you know, buttons can control stuff for this. If you can find these four parts, and you can find these four parts, typically uh, at least half of these you'll, you can find in waste supplies. Um, meaning uh, a lot of the stuff is essentially being trashed, um, uh, like unused. And so if you're really in a desperate situation, you don't even have to pay for it. If you want to pay for it, uh, typically under tw uh, 20 bucks will get you everything that you need for, uh, to handle your heating needs. 
Um, notably, I'm kind of uh, not distinguishing here between uh, like uh, per sample level heating needs and like on mass heating needs. Um, as it happens, you can use a lot of the same equipment, um, just bigger parts versus smaller parts, specifically the heating element um, and, and slightly different choices of design. Uh, but in short, this is not actually a, a particularly serious concern uh, heating. It's, it's a, one of the easiest ones here to tackle. Now, as far as uh, cooling goes, essentially we have two categories here. We have a sample by sample cooling, and then we have on mass cooling. Um, and here it makes a lot of sense to think about these separately. So sample by sample cooling, you know, th uh, think something like, um, you, you know, your, your classic ice bath is pr it's probably the, the simplest example that you can get at here. Um, you can also go deeper, which is what we're going, uh, going for here because ice, if we're being honest, is something that we all have access to. Or, uh, hold on, let me, let me not set, put out such a, a broad statement, but it's, it's something that if you don't have access to ice and uh, a lot of this other stuff is going to be uh, you know, kind of dead in the water. Um, so you can, you can largely tackle, uh, t tackle the problem of cooling on a sample by sample basis uh, using a, a, pretty simpler, a pretty similar set of parts. Uh, the, the best that I found are, are these Peltier modules. They essentially, uh, one side will heat up, one side will cool off. And so you can, uh, you can take these things and just wire them into voltage. They don't need any special control circuitry. You just kind of plug them in and they'll, they'll start heating on one half and cooling on the other. You have to find a way of getting rid of the heat. Um, typically, uh, you would put, a, let's say, a heat sink and then a fan pointing at the heat sink and then just uh, attach that to the Peltier module with thermal tape. And then you have a cold side that you can use for whatever you need. Um, the problem is that's going to keep cooling essentially until it reaches uh, thermal equilibrium, uh, kind of on a, an electrical standpoint, which is probably not the temperature you're going for. Um, so again, you'd need a temperature sensor and a brain. Um, uh, you know, simple feedback loops here can, can solve most of your problems. It's, it's not particularly difficult. And again, all these parts are widely available. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't really get into the um, kind of the, the logistics on the, on the technical side and software of, of how to make all this work. Um, you can go really simple, like, you know, if it's too cold, heat it up. If it's too hot, cool it down. Um, you can go a little more complicated. I would look into proportional integral derivative, uh, like loops and, and kind of that whole setup. But essentially, there, there are um, pretty easy and well-known solutions for this. And also, everything on the left here, you can also get for not under 20, in this case, under 35 when I was looking to put together a sample Amazon card to see how this all works out, um, which again, you know, combine it with the, the 24, uh, our last slide. And that means that for, you know, let's say $60 in tax, you can have your, your $100,000 piece of equipment, just a lot less shiny and probably not quite as many features. Um, then on mass, on mass, unfortunately, there, I mean, you can play with compressors if you really want to, to be honest, it's a, it's a lot of engineering work probably not worth it based on our experience. Um, uh, and I should have mentioned earlier, most of this experience was gained actually trying to build this hardware um, for our own personal use, because um, especially when you're working kind of a startup environment and you have very limited funds, spending it on $100,000 pieces of equipment is not really the best way of going about it. And so um, most of this stuff we have built uh, ourselves or at least tinkered around with ourselves. Um, and so this is kind of where we're basing all this out of. But on mass, uh, anything larger than, you know, like a plate full of samples and you really kind of don't have a good solution for ability yourself. In most parts of the world, thankfully, you can find a, a rather elegant solution. And this will carry you most of the way as, as far as we can, we can tell, uh, you know, fridges, freezers, Craigslist, and so on. Um, building it yourself really isn't worth it in most cases. Uh, next, we've got uh, mixing. So there tend to be two types of mixing that are used in labs. Um, one of them is, is blending and one of them is agitation. Now these are different because blending, for example, can be, uh, let's say, harmful to, to cells and there, there are other considerations here. Um, essentially, you're, you're introducing like elements of, of lysis instead of just kind of mixing things together. And uh, notably, you cannot uh, grow a culture in a blender. At least this, I've never been able to pull that off. Um, so if your goal is to reproduce um, agitation, you kind of want something specialized there. Um, your uh, kind of golden ticket there is going to be these little, like these vibration motors. They essentially look like, the, and they come in two form factors. There are these ones on the bottom that look like, uh, you know, typical rotary motors, except they have a, a weight that's offset to one side. And the idea there is that as it spins, it'll shake back and forth because of the uneven loads and that creates the vibration. Um, and so that's why it has this like semicircular uh, component at the end there. Uh, that's literally just a, you know, a half a flywheel. 
And then up top, we've got these little button cell types. They, you know, that's probably about the, the size of a, of a dime, an American dime. Um, so really small parts. Uh, they do gentle vibration. They're really good for a, like a small scale kind of vibration. If you're doing, let's say like, you know, on the, on the level of, you know, like literally sample by sample, um, anything larger than that, these aren't going to cut in. You're going to want one of these motors at the bottom. Combine that with uh, the, the handy dandy tools from previous slides over here and you've basically got yourself down. Um, you may want to incorporate some other kind of kind of sensor inputs so that you can make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. Except in general, the only thing that's monitored in, in the commercial products is, is kind of uh, RPMs in general. Uh, I mean, oftentimes they'll also have temperature because as you spin something, uh, friction will heat it up. But um, you know, if you have just RPMs, you can you can probably do this pretty well. Um, and so you may want to incorporate something like that. I didn't uh, put a picture in here, but you can find uh, rotary encoders for the motors are pretty good uh, for the button cell types. Things get a little more complicated, but you probably don't need it for something so small anyway. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of the really annoying category is uh, for separating things. So this tends to be where a lot of the, of the cost lives in the lab. And this is also one of the big things that we at the startup have kind of been stuck on is um, so like you're not, you're not going to build your own HPLC. I mean, I guess if you really want to, you can, but it's probably not something that most people go about and do by themselves. Most of the stuff that we've discussed today is, you know, something that, that anyone can theory build for themselves, um, given a little bit of electronics knowledge and access to an Amazon account. Um, this stuff gets harder. Um, and so in, in the case of separation, uh, the, the big thing that we've done is looking for uh, the, the commercial part secondhand, especially when used for applications for which they're no longer valid. And by the way, this is a very good trick to play whenever you're sourcing some of this equipment is um, across any of these categories, is that there are a lot of industries that require uh, really specific constraints for, for equipment to be considered valid, right? So for example, uh, you have your pipettes that get calibrated, you have you know, other equipment that can't get calibrated and just gets trashed if it can't be calibrated correctly. Um, and it's in certain applications, especially in, in uh, medical diagnostics, they tend to trash a huge amount of equipment because it fails calibrations. And oftentimes the, the margin of error is, is small enough that you can comfortably use it for yourself without really noticing any degradation of quality. Um, so uh, a lot of these secondhand parts are, are really, really good place to go, especially um, kind of this whole category of failed calibration, but it's still good enough for, for basically any other application on Earth. Um, so we tend to buy the stuff secondhand, and then there are a few sources that we can go into later, uh, but obviously that's strongly dependent on geographic regions, so not quite as uh, useful as the previous categories. Um, and then, then there's kind of the other category, which I've largely neglected here, um, partially because it drifts outside of our neat four category model, and partially because there are already really good solutions for some of these problems. So, you know, anything on here that you could need, you can probably source for quite, like sensors you can source quite cheaply. Just don't go looking for the biotech kind. Go looking for like the middle school science fair kind and they'll tend to be significantly lower cost with essentially the same part at the other end. Um, uh, microscopes, uh, spectrometers, a lot of this stuff, we have uh, kind of interesting solutions. And here I can give some shout outs to some people who've done some really cool stuff in this field. So for example, Foldscope uh, is a company, uh, I actually met the CEO at a Maker Faire one year, funny enough. Um, they came to the, the problem of how do we uh, give a microscope that can be used to diagnose malaria. So you wanna be able to, to look at the, I believe it's paramecia under, under a microscope and uh, the, the ones that are, um, the, like the microscopes that, that were previously being used for this are far too expensive for a lot of the, the malaria endemic areas of the world. So they just kind of took a, a crappy lens and a bunch of cardboard. These things you can buy, I think like 20 cents is, is the, the wholesale price for a microscope that you can use, use with a little bit of a headache for basically anything you need a microscope for. So um, fantastic uh, like thing to look into and also do it yourself versions of this are widely available. Um, next we have uh, centrifuges. So this is also comes from the same place of uh, malaria diagnosis. Um, so in, in the case of malaria, you have um, essentially your sample that you need to, to spin down. It turns out you, t you take one of these wheel toys from childhood and just kind of put the sample on, on the end in you know, tubes, the same kind that you the same consumables you're using every day, um, and then spin it up. And if you give them a few seconds to, to kind of get his popsicle sticks in there, you can see this alone can hit several thousand RPMs when just done by hand.
And so by using this sort of approach, you can essentially replicate the process of uh, centrifugation at essentially no cost. And especially considering that, you know, thinking back to that, I think it was slide number seven or something, um, centrifuges were kind of in the, the most expensive category. The fact that you can do this is absolutely fantastic and there are instructions readily available online for how to reproduce this. The one problem is obviously you get significantly less control over the parameters. Um, so finding ways of working around that is uh, kind of an ongoing thing that we've been thinking about. And I mean, thankfully we have access to a centrifuge, so we don't build, like we're not running a startup on these things, but um, essentially if, if you need a centrifuge and, and control over the parameters, uh, it falls kind of, you know, second fiddle to, uh, price the, there are some really great solutions out there. Um, and then finally kind of on the sensor side, um, there is a, a really, so there's a, a YouTube channel that does some really great work as far as building tools. And funny enough, um, Justin Atkin is actually registered to be at this very conference, so you can probably find him somewhere. Um, and so his, uh, his channel, the Thought Emporium, puts together a lot of these tools. This was a uh, DIY spectrometer um, that, yeah, that uh, they built for, I don't remember what the budget was, but it was quite inexpensive. And so essentially there's uh, like a prism and a camera in there and we can go into that, that place where we're looking at how, at how exactly that's constructed. But essentially, you know, this replaces a, a, a product that, could, that would typically be anywhere from a few hundred to a, a few thousand dollars um, to buy and uh, very low cost. And then finally, I'll, I'll give a really, really brief snippet here about lab robots. Um, we happen to have them available. Uh, these Opentron machines are like God on earth. They're, they're absolutely amazing. Um, and they're also here somewhere um, in the, the conference. So uh, worth, worth talking to. Um, the, the Opentron's machines are a few thousand dollars so you can get them secondhand for, for much less. And we've found that they, uh, based on our timing of our own work in the lab, improve, uh, especially for the things that we find ourselves having to do again and again and again, like a number of assays, 90% uh, reduction in time once you've written up the original protocol. So it really comes down to how, you know, how many times you're going to be using this thing for whether it's worth, you know, ripping out the Python script and writing up the protocol for this. Uh, amazing equipment. Um, and that's about it for the you listening to me talk section. Uh, so uh, I've been Tal Globus. You can access uh, my website, which is uh, currently under uh, renovations, long overdue. So uh, that, that should be back up in a few days. Uh, email over there. I've got a LinkedIn that doesn't have any of the biotech stuff, though I should really update it as soon as we're no longer super secret. And then uh, also BioCurious fairly often. Cool. So uh, that's me. Uh, that's my portion. And we should have a few minutes here for a kind of general discussion. Um, and the, the topic here is how do, we, how do we reduce the, the burden that the cost of these tools plays on people who are trying to work uh, within this area? And so uh, with that, you guys can all, you know, you should be able to unmute yourselves and kind of throw stuff in there as, you know, as you like. What, one question, I, hi, my name is Nikhil. Um, starting to think about uh, putting together a home lab as well for some research as a grad student. Uh, one question I have uh, is whether there are, um, you know, kind of initiatives that give small grants to people who are putting together home labs. Are there, are there sources of funding aside from all the great work you guys are doing to think about how to build your own hardware? Um, so I can only speak to the American side uh, because, you know, the, the blinders that you get from, from living in, in Silicon Valley, but um, here, there are grants if you want to tackle some problem that's of public value, right? So if you say, hey, like we want to do malaria research, actually, that's probably not a good one because medical is a whole separate problem. But um, we want to work on like environmental research or something, and then you actually do the environmental research, then yes, there are grants that you can uh, get it within the US. Um, the issue is you're, you, when you're building a whole lab, you're going to face questions of legitimacy. And I think that those are founded because, you know, you don't want just random people grabbing money from the government. On the other hand, um, it does become a barrier, especially when cost is such a significant uh, problem here and you're actually trying to work on something for, for the benefit of others. So, yeah, I mean, in the U.S., the, you can do it, but they're going to start exerting their fingers on what you're actually working on. Um, in other countries, I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd be really kind of encouraged to see uh, what there is. I know I was listening to a talk from someone based out of, uh, I think it was University of British Columbia. And so Canada has 
uh, kind of a number of, of these um, like incentive programs out there that'll fund you for a lot of this stuff. And uh, that's exciting. Then again, I don't live in Canada. Just a quick, quick follow up. I, you know, I think what would be interesting is whether there are private, uh, private opportunities for small grant, uh, small grants, you know, for various types of, of research that are not specifically for like health or um, particular uh, 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 problems of, of public interest, but would still be interesting for the general public to like kind of know about. So we don't need to know whether those exist right now, but it, it, like what if, if anybody does know of like, you know, private uh, uh, places for small grant funding, maybe throw it in the chat and like, it's probably an area of opportunity for, you know, kind of philanthropy and other, other folks like that to, to jump in. I mean, yeah. Does, does anyone know of these kinds of opportunities? I'd, I'd love to know myself. Um, sure. So I will also give you um, contract research is a, is a thing. It, it tends, again, you're going to get legitimacy questions, but there, if you, my experience has been, if you can find a company and, and address them directly, like if it's not like the standard, like, you know, grant writing process, um, or at least I haven't found it to be, I would love to know if there's, you know, like a private organization that you can just do like classic grant writing for. And, and I mean, grant, granted the process sucks, but, um, uh, it's, it's something that we're familiar with and, and can work with like kind of within the const uh, constraints of, um, so if there are, uh, private companies that are looking to get kind of contract research done and would be willing to trust the guy in a the basement, then, you know, uh, my email's up there, uh, you know, if you want it. Um, and I'm sure it would uh, be of uh, benefit to everyone else here as well. Um, also, we, it looks like we've got uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, if anyone else has uh, kind of anything to throw into the pot, I'd be really interested in, so kind of the idea here was, we happen to be kind of a, an apt group to talk about this just because we've been working on it ourselves, but we also know that we are certainly not the only ones who are doing this. And there are a number of, of groups, including those kind of I showed off at the end that have done some really great progress. Um, if you could share like a little bit of your story or get back in contact um, uh, over like the Slack or, you know, whatever, uh, we'd, we'd kind of really love to, to keep these conversations open because we realize that all this stuff that, you know, gets figured out by one person can then be used by all the, the, the parties involved. You know, everyone can benefit from someone solving this, these problems once. Um, and so if we can kind of find a way of putting together a, a dialogue that kind of you know, stays active over time to, to answer some of these questions and, to provide resources, you know, share research and so on. Uh, this would be probably a, a really, really great way of tackling a lot of these uh, these economic constraints, these sort of, sort of problems. Hi, Tal, this was great. Uh, one of the things that I discovered was that, um, yes, there are lots of resources on the internet. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of those projects are like abandoned where like they kind of stop in the middle, they never been tested and so on. Um, and I think it would be great if we can have a place where some of these are going to be validated somehow. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably encounter the same uh, experience. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, that would be if someone could put together like a Wikipedia for projects in this area, cause like that that's sort of general model, that would be brilliant. But I I don't know of, so there, there are specific groups that have that kind of resources out to talk about their own work and their own progress, but I don't know of any that are kind of solving this stuff um, on a more general basis, you know, considering all the players involved and what they've, they've worked on and kept in touch with them. All I know about is a few websites where you can kind of find community labs that are still in play and, you know, get their contact info, but then that means, you know, manually emailing who knows how many labs and kind of, you know, trying to start conversations. So that's, it's not a very scalable way of going about it, but it's, the best I've found. I mean, does anyone know of, of that, like that kind of resource where you can see these sorts of projects and see which ones are still around and kind of they stay engaged with the community to some degree? Mm. Sure. Um, cool. So there's, I think that's about our time uh, right there. So I'd like to thank you guys all for, for watching and kind of you know, getting a, a sense of what we've been working on. Uh, we've, we've been having a lot of fun working on these, these kinds of interesting problems and we, we love to share our progress as it comes out. Um, we don't have like a newsletter or anything that I can pitch other than my own personal uh, like contact info, which you know, if you want it, it's there. If you don't, I don't care. 
Um, but uh, it's really, really great to, to kind of get, get this opportunity to, to, you know, exchange ideas with the rest of the community and, and to see if what we've been working on can be helpful for anyone else. So thanks so much for giving us that opportunity and we, we really appreciate it.